I do want to say, ladies, you look gorgeous in your pictures. All of those, all those pictures are beautiful. Thank you. I need feedback, y'all. Blur or no blur for the background? <laughs> I like no blur. Okay. Second it, no blur. Okay. Like, I don't know what to do. This is not my original background, so I'm like adjusting a little bit. But everyone looks, I echo that. Everyone looks beautiful as well. I'm excited to be on this panel. I know it's going to be lit. <laughs> it's going to be webinars awesome. live. And then just for everybody who's joining us, there are no disclosures today. And then I um, just want to highlight the panel activity code today is 24239. And I am going to stop share and hand it over to Dr. Jane Carter. Thanks so much, Dr. Nari. It is my pleasure to introduce the Black Women's Mental Health Panelists this afternoon. I'm Dr. Jane Carter, moderator for the Black Women's Mental Health Panel. I am a Trinidadian and British transplant who moved from London to Texas to Trinidad and then back to the States to complete my training as a clinical psychologist. I've worked in inpatient psychiatry settings at a county jail and an in outpatient mental health center. My interest is both in a broad reform of mental health services to not only increase access to more people, but to also create a much more human and culturally informed response to mental health. In my work recently, the demand for concrete plans to address Black women's mental health in particular has been nothing short of overwhelming. I anticipate a lively discussion on the topic today and look forward to making meaningful connections in the process. It is my great pleasure to introduce you to our four panelists this afternoon, each an expert in her field. Ms. Nala Toussaint works with people across the spectrum of identities, social and economic realities to support their health goals and well-being. She has done extensive work as an outreach liaison, conducting safe sex interventions for youth and coordinating educational and job development services at renowned LGBT public service organizations. Nala is the founder of Reuniting of African Descendants or Road, a trans-led grassroots initiative invested in equity, collective growth, and healing for TLGBT, LGBTQIA, and SGL. Nala, you're gonna have to help me out with all of the, all of the letters in there, um, people of African descent. Um, Dr. Jessica Ism, MD, MPH, is a board certified community psychiatrist and clinical instructor in the Yale Department of Psychiatry. She is the founder of Vision for Equity, LLC. Her professional interests include working toward eradicating racial and ethnic mental health disparities, mitigating the impact of implicit racial bias in clinical care, and the use of a community focused population health approach in psychiatric practice. Welcome. Dr. Nicole Christian Brathwit, MD, is a nationally recognized board certified adult, child and adolescent psychiatrist. Dr. Christian Brathwit is the CEO and founder of WellMind Psychiatry and consulting company PLLC. Dr. Christian Brathwit is the SVP and medical director of Array Behavioral Care, the largest telepsychiatry company in the United States. Welcome. Ms. Zahara Green is the founder and executive director of Transcending Barriers, a trans-led group whose mission is to empower the transgender and gender non-conforming community in Georgia through community organizing with leadership building, advocacy, and direct services. Welcome, panelists. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. So let's jump right in. Uh, I, I guess one of the things that I would like to do is just kind of start with um, maybe a, a broader introduction that you kind of start with yourself to talk about what is most important to you. Um, yeah, just what, what interested you about being here today? Let's start with that. 
I'll just jump in. Hey, hello everyone. My name is Dallas Simone Toussaint again. And uh, what's important to me is a global conversation about eradicating anti-Blackness and, and also gender-based violence, which uh, gives us space to look at how trans women, cis women, girls, brown, black are treated across the world. And I think uh, more than ever we're seeing because our access to technology, we're having access to how girls have been always saying we've been treated. Uh, uh, and so there is a conversation about what protection looks like, um, what uh, housing looks like, what food insecurity looks like. Um, and as we know, you know, not pretending not to know, right? Uh, we're grieving, right? We're in a collective space of grieving when we're seeing not only uh, our siblings being murdered, but also uh, by health, right? Whether it's mental health, whether it's a uh, pandemic, uh, Black girls, um, and women have been in the center of many epidemics that never get classified as epidemic. And so that's what's important to me today. And just to echo around um, the, the list of TG, it's important for me as trans a woman to put T first because the history around LGBT is that T is there first. Uh, T has always been uh, at the forefront leading major movements. Uh, so it's important. And SGL creates space for same gender loving as a political stance because uh, LGBT, such as gay, lesbian, is not something that black and brown folks had access to back in the 60s, the 70s. And so same gender loving was the language that they were able to use versus saying gay or lesbian. And so I think um, creating space for everyone to identify, especially across folks across the African diaspora, is so important. Thank you so much for educating me. Um, I can, oh, please. Oh. <laughs> Thank you Nicole, um, for that. I mean, I'll just say anytime we're centering a community that's pretty much ignored in conversations around mental health and the multiple pandemics that Nala was referencing, I'm here for it. Um, so talking about black girls, black women uh, across the spectrum of differences in that category is something we're showing up for. So I'm looking forward to having an in-depth conversation about what is really an impactful demographic that's shaking tables all over the place and doing lots of work to improve others' lives, but that needs some of that reciprocated in the form of attention and also action, so. Similar to, to Dr. Jessica, I'm a psychiatrist. I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist and also specialize in perinatal and postpartum care. So my interest is multifold, both looking from the mother, the parent side of things, our children are suffering, the rates of suicide amongst black youth are increasing exponentially much faster than other populations. And this year in particular, the access to mental health services are just not there. So, you know, our kids aren't at school, but the families that are having DCF called on them are our families. Many kids aren't logging on to online learning, but the white families are not being sent to juvenile justice, but our kids are. Our kids are not being referred to therapy. And then the same, you know, thinking about perinatal and postpartum services, Black women are dying from all causes related to pregnancy and postpartum, including depression and suicide. And we are not being screened, we're not being recognized, we're not being heard. And so I'm hoping to, to use this conversation as a platform to discuss that, to bring awareness and to also give our, ourselves a moment to have a voice and to, to really speak about what we're dealing with. Yes. Um I think this is perfect to have a conversation about something that is so meaningful for Black trans femmes, Black femmes, Black people who are dealing with all of the issues, especially when you're looking at the intersection that exists within our communities and how we can address these issues that cause so much harm to our communities is very important. So I'm very excited to be engaged in a conversation around this, these, these issues that we've been seeing. Well, thanks everyone, I'm so excited. So there's a lot of discussion about representation and how much it matters for communities of color and particularly in terms of health outcomes. And some of you have touched on that um, already. And things like health literacy and disparities in healthcare, this has been especially relevant with COVID happening all around us and who has access and who is willing to kind of take the vaccine, for example. 
Um, this is not a new conversation, but I'm wondering for each of you, how frequently your own identities in terms of race, gender, um, gender identity, or culture becomes a focal point in the work that you are doing in the communities. Yeah, I think the first thing that comes to me is always having to be in the intersection to challenge pathology and how other races or other groups see um, the intersection of my identities as a uh, first generation Black, Afro-Caribbean, trans, pansexual girl who's actually fat as well. It's all those things who has a disability. All those things is like, sometimes when people see our cultures based off of media, there's a pathology or ideology that comes for it. And even let's acknowledge uh, theologians and how they speak on trans or LGBT. So there's so many intersections to tackle before we even start talking about the well-being. You know, we, we look at folks and don't really get to have the human experience based off of the identity. We remove people from the human experience and again, pathologize them and remove them from the access. You know, so what uh, a sister of mine, Ashley Lords uh, Hunter, she wrote, doctor, excuse me, doctor, uh, Lords Ashley Hunter, she wrote, just because you got the vaccine doesn't mean that you're smarter. It just means that you had access. And I often think about how many black, uh, brown women and girls across the identity spectrum of race, social class, have access to that, right? And so what my fear is, and kind of changing it, but it makes sense is that we start um, demonizing folks for not having access rather than having the uh, conversations, what is needed for communities that are underserved. We don't ask the how, the what, the when, but what we do is we saying we failed or well, this happened. We became we become the, the finger pointing and the blaming and we never really sit down and say, well, how did we get here? Yes, we can have conversation about glass ceilings being broken and, and having spaces, but we never talk about where the pieces of those glasses fall. I mean, one useful place that Black people broadly sit, but specifically Black women, and especially those with intersectional identities that are marginalized, is as the repository for all things that are bad. So you get all the good stuff, all the positive qualities, positive characteristics, the best parts of human beings. And we are stuck with you depositing all of the negative, more um, not as desirable parts of humanity are, are in us. So when these problems come up and we're trying to figure out why do the statistics look like this? Well, they just didn't want it or they're being difficult um, or they're not reachable or they're not doing what they're supposed to do. There's no mentalization of our humanity as Nala was describing. And there's really a rejection of the fact that there's any complicity in things being the way that they are. Um, so most things are externalized as being our problem, nothing to see here. And then people can sidestep a responsibility to actually offer a practical solution. Uh, and blackness is not synonymous with badness. Black, black versus white lies, all the symbolism that we um, surround ourselves with should be challenged. That's one small step that people can um, take concrete example, there's a new app out there called Clubhouse. Um, and the, the way that you know someone has been bad is that there's a black uh, badge on their profile. So you're already implicitly communicating in technology that the bad people are associated with blackness as badness. So all these small symbolic manifestations are something that we should be paying attention to. Sorry, my four-year-old was supposed to be taking a nap and he just snuck in behind me. So sorry. That's all good. <laughs> and he That's doesn't like to wear good. pants either. So I <laughs> apologize in advance for that. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, thinking about representation, I, you know, I have to say for me as a psychiatrist and as a patient, um, it's very meaningful. So I, when I was pregnant with my first son, I experienced severe postpartum depression. Nobody asked me, nobody screened me for it. And the only time it actually, I even realized it was so bad was when I actually had thoughts of ending my life. And I, I really believed in that moment that my family and my child would be better off without me. It's, it's almost like the depression takes over. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't myself. And I remember my son's, um, hold on one second, sweetheart. Um, my, my son's pediatrician, <laughs> now he's frustrated. Uh, my son's pediatrician is a, a black woman. And I remember she pulled me to the side after one of his well visits. And she told me, she's like, something, something is not okay. You are not okay. And I was trying to deny it because I, I didn't feel like I could tell anyone here, here I am a full fledged psychiatrist. And I didn't feel safe communicating my pain. And I remember she's like, you know, she said, go talk to your husband. 
I'm here, you need to get treatment. And I remember I told my husband I wasn't doing well. And he's like, he's, he's from Barbados. And he's like, well, let's pray about it. And I'm like, yes. And then after we get off our knees, I need to make a phone call because I need support. But then I couldn't find someone who understood black pain. I couldn't find someone who I felt like I could connect to and could recognize the difficulty of being a black mother who did not have significant maternity leave, who was trying to, to manage what it means to, to have a black son. And so, you know, my, my work as a black child psychiatrist and a perinatal psychiatrist is that we need to see us. We need to talk to someone who understands us. The biggest challenge is that there's not enough of me. And there's so many more women and families who are, who are really struggling. But I, you know, I think as providers, as helpers, the big question is who's helping the helpers. And I'm sure many of us have experienced that over this last year. We're, we're burning out and we don't always have those outlets and those resources. Thank you. Um, and also thinking of from my experience of being a black trans femme, um, those intersections are intersections that are pushed on the margins of our society. And we think of the power structure that existed within our society around white supremacy, capitalism, and all the different power structures that exist that seeks to keep the marginalized community oppressed. And that has been, understanding that has been instrumental towards moving the work, understanding that others with these identities are have similar experience to that I've had. Um, and also inserting being someone who is formerly incarcerated, dealing with the criminal justice system, this criminal punishment system in a way and having that experience also, and which is also another experience that is unique and pushed on the margins of our society. And that, those identities have all been instrumental to pushing the work, moving the work and everything toward the goals of, of, of of abolishing these systems and, 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 and addressing these systems in ways where they cannot harm our communities. Everyone's making such really impactful points about the need for connection, the need for just kind of knowledge, baseline knowledge. Before we start to treat, we should know, we should have context, we should be able to understand. Um, tell me what you think about this as an idea, because I think that just representation is not enough until we can really truly represent in a way that is kind of proportionate to the demand. And so that makes me think about the spaces where there is not sufficient representation and how we, we need to be making the connections with the with the other groups of people who exist in, in most of the spaces where we all work and how we communicate the needs that are there and get people kind of on board with this. I don't know what your thoughts are. I know I didn't prepare you that I was gonna ask that, but, but it's a follow-up question. Thank you. I, you know, when you were, when you were um, asking that question, what I thought about was representation. And I think, and I also thought about systems and how even in those systems that we need representation have so many criteria that will never um, create space for women like ourselves because the criteria was never informed with our lived experience. And so when I think about going back to Brown versus education to now what we have folks in school, those texts, those texts and those books have not been changed. The requirements for education have not been shifted. So when I think about, when we think about school push out for black girls across the identity spectrum, we have not yet interrogated, challenged, changed those systems that are informing our kids, our very beings. We're not even talking about inclusivity yet in schools. We're not even talking about consent. And so what we do is when we're, you know, setting off our kids, which sometimes we're fearful of, and I say our kids because I am a mother of the motherless because I've seen too many black uh, women and girls across the, the trans experience be kicked out of home, which if you watch polls, you understand the house system, right? And so when I say our kids, I literally mean our kids who get pushed out of school with not, not just because of the bullying or the infrastructure that's, that's set up, is because the mental health, the impact of that. Imagine being excited to go to school to learn something and don't find yourself in text. You don't find anything that affirms your existence. 
And when you're met with challenges, whether your learning curve is off where, you, where folks say you should be, there isn't systems or access to resources to support and get that person where they need to. So I think, yes, representation we need, but we also have to interrogate and challenge what are the systems that are currently existing and how do is a support our lived existence? I want to also challenge folks because sometimes I hear the, well, everyone's acting as a victim. And I think 400 years proves folks as, uh, as victims, yes, but also we can be in victimization or we can challenge and say, let's look at our oppressors. Let's look at the things that have attacked us. We never, again, we never looked at what the violence is coming from and how the violence, we, we blame survivors. We blame and we, we target resilient people who are in a place of resiliency by force, not by choice. Emergency is a, a lack of access of choice. Many of us do not have the choice. We literally have to figure it out as we go. And I think we need to interrupt that. Sorry, I know I said a lot. I love it when people center the oppressor in these conversations because that's where the pathology is, but we never talk about that. Um, and the thought that I had when you were asking the question was like a deep sigh because a part of what I thought was, okay, well, this is this thing where, yes, there's going to be this coalition building, well, hopefully, and then who's going to be spearheading the charge and usually, you know, it's us. <laughs> I'm like, Lord, another, <laughs> you know, coalition along with the 15 others that I'm participating in and often leading with some of the people here um, in this group. And it reminds me of the other thing that we're dealing with is like, which I know we're going to talk about is how we cope with all the responsibility that's forced upon us often. Um, even if people ask us, will you do it? There's like an implicit expectation that you are going to say yes. Um, and if you don't say yes, then you kind of leave a system unchanged, or at least that's what it feels like. Um, so I know people talk about like John Henryism and like sojournism, um, where essentially we're trying to sustain our work in contexts that are essentially crushing us. Um, and how we do that can be very adaptive, um, which we can talk about what that looks like, but it can also be uh, not good, maladaptive and problematic. And then we're sort of chipping away at our, our life expectancy and our quality of health and all these sorts of things. Um, and people are not thinking about those things as they're asking us to do things for them uh, and make use of us in this work. So there's, that was what was going through my mind with that question. I don't feel like there's much more to say. I mean, you, you two have said, said it all so eloquently, but I, I agree with, with everything that you've said. I, I think this year, I feel more emboldened, one, to say no, um, but two, also to set parameters when people ask me to come and give a talk. So I, I work with a lot of schools and schools all over the place are asking me to come and talk about racism and come and talk about trauma. And I, I realize that they really want that to check a box. They want to say us, white people have had this, you know, we had this black woman come and give a talk and we've addressed racism. And so I've gotten to the point now where I'm like, one, pay me. Two, I am not coming to do this work unless you have a plan to continue the work after I leave, because this is a waste of my time. When I talk about this, this takes emotional, physical, and spiritual energy away from me to be engage in these conversations, particularly with communities and environments that may not be receptive to what I have to say. And so if I'm coming into this conversation and you know, when, when people, um, white people or um, non-Black people say, well, how do I deal with racism? One, I, you know, break it down into there's the individual work, there's the institutional work, and then there's the societal and structural work. If you really want to address it, you have to look at it on all three levels. It can't just be, well, I read this book about white fragility, so here I am. No, it's okay. Well, have you worked with your school? Have you worked with your city and state? What do you, who, who are you voting for? And are you voting? And are you helping other marginalized group? groups access voting, but then also, you know, these organizations and people have to have a plan. There needs to be a long-term strategic plan with money and resources invested. And I, and I feel like, I don't know, maybe COVID-19 has just gotten me to the point where I don't care as much, but I find that I'm, I'm saying to people that Black people, we never created this problem. Racism was not something created by us. Race was not created by us. So Stop looking to us to solve a problem that you caused and continue to perpetuate. So when you're asking me for help, my first question is, are you ready to do the work? And are you ready to invest the time and resources that that one diversity and inclusion person that you have at your job that keeps turning over because you're exhausting them is not enough? Who else are you paying to do this work? And what sacrifices are, are you willing to make to, to actually affect change? 
Yeah, I mean, I agree with everything that was said. Um, to add to it, you know, for me, it was just all of the being stretched in so many different areas with all of the identities that I have. And I had to create boundaries for myself to protect my spirituality, my mental health, my physical health, all parts of myself, you know, and I had to create those boundaries. So that was very important for me with, as I was moving forward with the work, recognizing how that was taking so much on, on me. So this kind of leads me to think about um, just that emotional burden and also sometimes just occupational burden. <laughs> so to be a professional woman of color, to be a professional black woman means that everyone says, oh, well, either, either this person is, is our token and represents the fact that we are anti-racist or they will run the anti-racism commit, <laughs> committee. They will, they will do the job. Like, like many of you have already acknowledged, the burden is not balanced and we need it to be more balanced. And I've heard a, a lot of really important solutions around just kind of interrogating the system and creating space so that people can actually be in a position to, to be hired. They can be in a position to actually move through organizations and institutions. Um, and to be truly anti-racist means to understand the systems of oppression and to dismantle those systems. That's the only way you can truly be anti-racist. Um, and so thinking about that, thinking about one of the questions that was asked actually says that, um, someone asked about kind of witnessing what has happened most recently. So that I'll just read the question verbatim. It says, how devastating is the impact of watching an American male of African descent murdered at the hands of a police officer? More specifically, how detrimental is this on the mental health of Americans of African descent? So there have actually been many studies that have been replicated showing that one, watching these videos, we have the same physiologic reaction that we would have if we were there physically watching it happening or if it were happening to us. So our muscles are tensing. We're going into that fight, flight, or freeze. We're going into that stress response, which you know was really only meant to be for a short period of time. If you're running away from a wild animal, you get away from it, then your heart rate decreases. It was never meant for it to be continuous and ongoing and happening every few minutes or every few days. Like that, that is that's toxic, that's stressful, and it, it literally wears down our bodies. And there, there have even been studies looking at young people watching these videos. And they've shown that even weeks or months after seeing videos of Black people being murdered in race-related crimes, up to 15% or more of these kids months later meet criteria for generalized anxiety disorder or post-traumatic stress disorder. So Number one, I don't. I I am I'm very careful about what I allow into my space, me mentally, physically, spiritually. So I I don't watch these videos. I don't watch the news because I I recognize what is trauma for me. That right. those videos, those discussions are traumatic for me. So I, I am very clear that I do not watch those. And first of all, I don't need to see someone die to care, and I don't need yeah. to 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 see someone be murdered to be angry. So that that is just. I mean, that's like, what, what is it called? Like trauma porn, essentially. And, mm -hmm. and I think often the, the media uses our deaths as entertainment, mm -hmm. but it's entertainment for them. It's trauma for us. And um, some of you, or many of you may be familiar with the term adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. And, and it was a study basically showing the more negative traumatic experiences you have before the age of 18, the greater the risk of long-term mental and physical health problems later. So like diabetes heart disease, high cholesterol, early death, which is more common in black people because we experience more trauma. And so, you know, we have to think about exposure to these things for ourselves and for our kids. Like trauma's cumulative and trauma hurts. And so we have to be very discerning about what we let our kids watch and what, what we watch. Mm -hmm. And I would even argue that this is not just a trauma that impacts the African-American community. I would argue that watching this is traumatic for everyone and also that it perpetuates a lot of the racism that we are trying to counteract. 
Yeah, you know, as I heard Dr. Nicole uh, talking, what came to me was like, everyone has a different trauma response. And so sometimes seeing these uh, videos, you have people who freeze up, you have folks who go into deep depression. And again, thinking of people in uh, intersex intersecting identities or where they are, you know, thinking about when we're talking about reproductive health, individuals who, and I like to look at people who are, you know, carrying or conceiving a child, seeing something like this and you're in an intersection of blackness puts a weight on that postpartum depression as well. Because the question, you know, we think about everything is going good and then bam, something happens. How do I protect my child? I just had a child. How do I protect my child in this time, such a time like this? And so going back earlier, we talked about, uh, you talked about Dr. Nicole, particularly how folks come to you for the answers. It's like going to the, M the EMS, going to save someone and they're asking the victim, how can we save you? You don't know how to fix something when it's emergency, it's an absence of choice. We did not choose to be in a system of this. So I don't think it's a responsibility daily to ask black and brown folks of how to fix the system. What we can talk about is where it hurts. What we can talk about is how long it's been hurting. What we can talk about is what we need in this moment, and how people can get out the way. And if folks are not willing to relinquish their control, then then don't invite us to the space. Don't ask us to do the work. If you don't have a contingency, uh, contingency plan, like how you would do with money for people, then don't invite me to the space. So to answer that question of trauma, I think folks are, when people say tired, what folks are saying, we're depressed, we're probably tired, we're exhausted, our bodies, we can't do it no more. We need support and we need people to step up and do the work that they're called to. And if you don't know how, there is Google. Do not go to your black and brown friends to ask them, well, how do I do this? Start with Brene Brown, start with some push out books. And after you read the book, ask yourself, what do I need to do now? Are you checking in with your folks before you ask, hey, can I tell you about this? Do you ask them, do you have the capacity? If we're thinking about the well-being of black and brown bodies, did you check in and say, how's your heart today? Do you have the capacity? How are you loving up on yourself? Where does it hurt? We don't ask you, we don't interrogate these systems and we don't ask questions to humanize people's lived experience and the impact that we see from seeing another black and brown body die, no matter what the cause or what narrative that we see or, or the stories we author in our head about why it's justified. I don't think there's any justification for a death where we see other people receive grace, particularly white or non-Black folk. Right. Thank you so much. So, I mean, I wish we were in person. Can I just say it? Can I just put that in the space? I just, oh my goodness. Can you imagine this energy in one room? Wow, 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 wow. So, I mean, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Everything that you just said. I. I want to stick with that because so and on the topic of us not being in the same room, we can't look around to see who is in this, who is in this meeting. There are 157 people in the meeting, um, but we can't see who is in the meeting. And I think that it's worth having a conversation, like understanding that every woman represented here is a leader, is a mentor in some ways. How are you talking to people about in, in your spaces where you are? How are you talking to them about American racism, about politics, about the pandemic and the future? My colleagues? Anyone. Well, I was gonna say, um, I, I mean, I go to work and I come home mostly because I have like 10 other spaces that I'm participating in about the same thing. Um, and, it's hard to overcome other people's silence about everything that you just listed and um, their inability to be uncomfortable enough to hold space for me in an interaction. Um, so what Nala was just saying about what we've experienced, it's so hard to say two weeks ago because then there was like the two weeks ago plus one day ago stuff. So there's really no um, demarcation between these events, but people have asked like, how are you? <laughs> like, well, I'm fighting racism in this organization. I'm also helping this listserv get their act together about this issue, striving to help 
people get better quality psychiatric care in this space over here, taking care of my three-year-old daughter who has to grow up in a racist and oppressive context. And then I'm here at work managing all my responsibilities for this job. And it's like a, how are you is not gonna allow me to make use of you and offering support to me. Um, so often me walking around is sort of like not uh, looking for human connection, one, because I might look and not receive it. And then two, um, because I don't know if I have the energy to, to work that hard for it. Um, so what I would say to people in this space is just make it easy. Um, offer me lunch, food. I mean, I love to eat. Um, help me get through the work day in that way. Give me a massage. <laughs> like Just something that recognizes that we are often holding a million different things. And I mean, we, we are almost about to drop them. We're not superhuman creatures in any way, shape or form. We're magical in different ways. We're not magical because we're superhuman. We're just human. Um, so we're holding things almost about to drop them, trying to sustain. And what can you do to offer to help authentically um, would be one thing to consider for people in the audience. Offer to take some work off our plate. <laughs> you really want to be helpful, <laughs> you know. You see the, the hundred and five emails that I have. Feel free to, to to volunteer to to take on one of those tasks. But I think also thinking about mentoring um, people of color. I, I I think validation is so important. Oftentimes, particularly talking to students, um, medical students, residents, trainees, they go through. They they see these experiences. They've witnessed death. And then they go to work and nobody mentions it. Nobody acknowledges that they're mourning the loss of yet another beautiful black soul. And, and so they then have to just hold on to that and they have to go through their day as if it just didn't happen, as if they don't worry about their safety and their life and their success in this space. And so, you know, you know, one thing that I do with my mentees is just like, if you need to cry, cry. We will sit on the phone for a half hour and you can just cry. And also, I'm not pathologizing what you're experiencing because yes, this hurts. Yes, this is traumatic. Of course, you're walking through the day feeling angry and irritable. Of course, you may snap off on somebody if they say the wrong thing to you. Of course, you're at your wit's end because you have been working twice as hard as everyone around you, but been given half the recognition. And so I think one is just to, to validate young people of color and yes, this is painful. And no, you don't need a diagnosis to, to validate your pain. And it, because, you know, this is not your fault. This is the, the trauma that's been put on you. And the reaction that you're having is an expected reaction to trauma. And so if we're thinking about speaking to allies, one is just acknowledging that your colleagues or your students or the young people around you have experienced trauma and they are hurting, even if they don't say it, one, because they may not feel safe in your space to articulate their pain, but two, offering support for them. And you know, frankly, therapy doesn't need to be, because you have a diagnosis, therapy should be a safe space to dedicate this time to yourself and process whatever you're going through. So encouraging your the people around you and giving them, if you're in a position of power, giving people the time, space, and energy to seek their own wellness, whatever that may look like, whether it's therapy or whether it's taking a day off or giving, giving that person space to grieve. Like, you know, a lot of people have said, I, I can't go to work today. It's, it's too much. There, there are studies showing that black people lose an average of two and a half days a week per year because of racial trauma, because of witnessing murder and death. And sometimes we need that just to be able to come back to work and deal with everything else that, that we have to manage. Yeah, uh, I, so whew, I'm telling you, <laughs> Dr. Jessica, Dr. Nicole, I'm like, my mind is going in a totally different direction. But uh, to, to think through that question, and I'm just gonna just process it as it comes. I thought about the African siblings that I work with uh, residing particularly in Congo, Kenya, and Uganda, how I'm navigating conversation with them because Again, race on, on the continent of Africa looks different as it pertains to uh, within the US. However, the violence is still the same. So the conversations that I have with them is, where does it hurt today? Did you eat today? What brings you joy? What does healing looks like? And most of the time, the answer is met with, I don't know. I haven't had space or time to think about that. So when we're in conversation, I said, well, in this moment, use this time. What if we just sat in silence together? What if you just cried? Sometimes it's removing my, my hat as a minister in training and saying, I'm here with you as a person. 
And if you need me to pray, I can pray with you. And if prayer is not enough and you want to cuss and scream, then let's cuss and scream. Whoever, wh whatever we need to do in those moments. I, I want to echo what Dr. Nicole and Dr. Jessica said, is having people be with, with, with where they're at allowing them to be vulnerable and also saying, hey, vulnerability also means boundaries. Not everyone needs to know how you are because that is not vulnerability because people will use your vulnerability and say, well, you're having a tough time at work. So I think we have to let you go, which that's not sustainability, right? When we know offices and jobs do not have infrastructure to keep black folks, particularly in mental health crisis like this. There is, yes, we might talk about FMLA. Yes, we might talk about short-term disability, but the same level of grace that is given particularly to white or non-black is not often given to black folks because we're required to be at our very best at all times. We're required to put out fires. So what I teach my mentees is find that one person that is in your higher up that you can be vulnerability, that you know that your vulnerability will not be taken as uh, a way to weaponize your existence and your survival, right? Use PTO if you have it. Take a sabbatical if you can. Create a GoFundMe for your rest and healing. Yeah, and send it to your white counterparts. Absolutely. You need a vacation, send it to them. Hey, I need a mental health day. That requires me to be away for a month. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, I think we get afraid of requesting and asking for, for stuff um, <laughs> because the shame of that we don't get to rest and we do get to rest. It is essential and required for our well being. And so, what I teach folks is to rest. Yes, someone got murdered. Yes, someone got killed. But today you have breath. We can grieve in that and we can do this. <sighs> Breathe in the discomfort, feel what you need to feel, and you allow yourself the time to shift. So sometimes it might be 15 minutes, sometimes it may be at the end of this week, or sometimes maybe make a month. But you set a goal when you're gonna shift for your joy and your healing while you're on this planet. Uh, I would say that this is an area that I find to be difficult, um, just hearing all of the other amazing panelists talk about how they navigate through it. Um, for me, it's just something that I find very difficult because for me, I'm experiencing it as well as it's happening. And, but I try my best to listen as much as possible, but I'm not one who is experienced in being a therapist or one who works in the mental health field. So I think that people who are dealing with that level of, of things should also, because that's something that I would seek as well if it becomes too much for me to handle. So I'm just not well-skilled, but I am one who is skilled at listening. So I do offer an ear to those who are struggling in those ways. And that's a beautiful thing because uh, there are so many people who see people like myself um, and Dr. Nicole and others because they don't have access to an ear, you know, that actually sees them as a human being. If we could prescribe that, <laughs> I think our, our business would plummet. Um, so that is a therapeutic intervention, active listening, um, offering empathy and just recognizing someone's humanity. So. I see that we are running low on time. And one of the things that I always think is really important to do is to ask what practical takeaways we have. And so number one, I'm gonna open up the floor in a, in a few minutes to have questions from the audience. Um, and then also I want to know specifically from each of you, where do you need help? That's, so do you want us to answer the, where do we need help now? Or do you want to open the floor? <laughs> Just check in <laughs> I was like, I can go on and on and on. Uh, but do you want to open the floor first? Or do you want us to answer that question? Just checking in Dr. J. Uh, I think if I want us to, I want us to answer the question. Okay. Um, where do I need help? Um, I hate being that girl. I think um, particularly, I'm just going to be vulnerable with my organization. It has literally been a struggle. And I think I talked to you yesterday about Dr. Jane about really allocating resources 
that is connected to girls on the continent. Uh, a friend of mine said to me, we forget that when we feed one woman, that woman feels, feeds a village. And so I think about um, the trans women who are, uh, are in, particularly in Uganda, who have to engage in sex work for survival. And so let's just say they are with a client. That client only pays them one US dollars. That one US dollars help them eat, sometimes get HIV medication, and sometimes even put a roof over their head. And so I think about global conversation where we think about eradicating violence on women and girls. I often think about how we forget what that may look like on the continent, what that may look like even here. Uh, our change our link. So what I need help with, if you know, if you're good on setting up stuff on website, volunteer. If you know how to take intake forms, volunteer. If you know how to do a data GIS uh, system, volunteer. If you know how to move funds, volunteer, get the funds going. I, you know, right now we have about 15 trans girls, particularly in Co Congo, who need to get housing and food. So if you know how to move, uh, allocate some funds, please do. We are 501c3. Thank God. If you have connections with the United Nations, connect me to them as well. If you know how to get an uh, NGO, connect me with them as well. <laughs> I think it's, it's hard for me to ask for help. Um, so when someone says, what do I mean? Like that, that's actually a hard question for me to answer because I am, um, I'm not often I don't even know if I feel comfortable asking for help, which is terrible because I always tell the people that I work with, you have to ask for help. Asking for help is a strength. And here I am, you know, doing the, the complete opposite. But I mean, I think, um, I don't know if as much of the individuals as if I need help one, because I value, I, I value therapy. It has saved me. I continue to engage in therapy and I, I'm fortunate to work with a therapist who pushes me and um, who calls me on my stuff. And so I, I am able to get a, a lot, I'm, I'm, I get fed through therapy. I also get fed through my friends and family. But I think, you know, if we're thinking about helping the movement, helping to decrease disparities in education and helping to decrease disparities in um, maternal health rates and um, people dying from pregnancy related complications, you know, I think one, again, like resources. So your time, your money should be dedicated to the right organizations and more importantly, dedicated to organizations that target people of color and even more specifically black people. So, you know, not just broadly giving to some national organization, but taking the time and energy to look for organizations that specifically help the most marginalized communities or specifically support black families. Um, and you know, if you're calling one of us to speak or to work with your organization, be ready and willing to pay us what we're worth. Um, and don't be surprised when we respond with our, the request for money. And I think that's one of the most frustrating things is that I know my white colleagues they're not nickel and dime when they're asked to speak. They're, they're not asked to volunteer for the cause. They're, they're paid, they're, they're, their time is recognized, their resources recognized. And so if you wanna help, see us for what we're worth, see us for the valuable individuals that we are and be willing to invest in us, be willing to invest in the movement. And you know, again, looking to create long-term commitments for your organization. It's not, you know, not just looking to have us come and speak for one or two hours and then go, but having us be part of a much larger organizational structure and plan. Um. That, that is definitely a tough question for me as well. Thinking of where I need help, I always think about balance. Um, sometimes um, that's, that's something that I always think about where an area in my life where I feel that I need help. Sometimes the work, um, being that, doing the work towards helping individuals in the community, serving the community is a lot of weight. And also that weight is compounded with, with, with being that person who so many members of my family rely on for support and also friends as well. So it, for me, it's very difficult to find that balance because once I try to, it's just it's always that, that what I feel is that responsibility to those who are suffering, those who are, need someone. So balance is one of those things where I feel that I need help in that area. 
Yeah, I feel like this is a therapy question, <laughs> which is sad, but it's, it's, a, it's a whole therapy question. <laughs> so I'm just echoing everyone's sentiments about how hard it is. But um, I mean, I put in the chat that learned helplessness is not helpful. Like don't infantilize yourself as if you can't do anything. Cause we, <laughs> there's a lot I could say. I'm not gonna go super like uh, psychoanalytic but um, we are sort of like feeding the entire world in a number of different ways. And the world is used to eating from us This in the same ways that babies eat from the breast. It's like we're a perpetual breast feeding the world in a number of different ways. And they don't care that we have this <laughs> overwhelming responsibility. Um, so part of it is just taking on for yourself the same things that we do to get to where we are, which is not waking up overnight and being experts on any topic we put in the labor to do so. Of course, coupled with lived experience, but, but that's it. We read books, we read articles, we talk to people, we listen to people. That's all that we do. And if you could take on a piece of that for yourself to do some of your own learning and skill building, that would be a way of being helpful in addition to paying people what they are worth and actually adding tax to that because we haven't been paid for long enough. So you should pay extra, so. Okay. Oh, Nala, you are muted. I was calling my partner because I was getting <laughs> private messaging <laughs> about where did uh, my partner get the flag. So I was calling my partner because they're at work. I wanted to be quick and I'm writing in the message. Um, I, my partner just communicated that they got it somewhere, but they don't think it exists anymore. So. If I find out, I'll, I'll tweet it or put it on Instagram. So thank everyone for the private messages about the flag. No, sorry. <laughs> okay, so I see that we have a few questions in the Q&A section. Um, some of which have been answered and some have not. I think that I would like to hear specifically from you, Zahara, to start about this question from Jennifer O, oh, who said, in your career, how do you balance your commitment to caring for black women, many of whom are marginalized financially with your own personal financial advancement? Can you repeat that question one more time? Sorry, Dr. Jane. Sure. In your career, how do you balance your commitment to caring for black women many of whom are marginalized financially with your own personal financial advancement? For me, for me it always starts with if, if you ate today. Um, I grew up in a Caribbean household that understood how to leave the door open um, for the neighbor who smelled their food who may be hungry. And so I, I give that to my grandmother, the, particularly the matriarch of my family, my grandmother, my aunt, and my mother, um, where I grew up having friends who I didn't even know were navigating homelessness or um, navigating in and out foster home. And my mom would always cook and she was like, save some for your friends. I'm like, no friends is coming over today. What do you mean? I want more. But she always taught me that you never know uh, the next person is going through. So I always saw people come into my house just for food. And so it starts with, hey, did you eat? Did you have a meal? Was it warm? Was it hot? Um, and then going into the kinship, how's your heart today? What's new? What's going on? Because as uh, my sister Zahara said, sometimes being the listen air is the best thing that you can offer to someone and meeting them with empathy, not giving them solution, but saying, I hear you. I'm sorry you're going through this um, and I'm with you. And creating space for whatever else comes out of that. And so that's how I think I offer monetarily. Again, it's housing for me as an organization, sometimes giving girls clothes. Um, sometimes we don't even realize that a lot of girls need clothes, <laughs> you know, when we think about going back to work. So if I have a dress that no longer fits or too big or too small, I give it away. And if I haven't worn it in seven years, it needs to go. So it's just those little things that we miss. Um, sometimes taking girls on uh, with me, hey, let's do a self-care day to you. Let's get your nails done. Let's get your hair done. How do you feel? 
right? De actively giving them the practice of how to love themselves. And if it's not here, such as my uh, masculine centers uh, friend, uh, they, they experience joy differently. Sometimes it's in a video game. Sometimes it's in, you know, buying a tool to build. So creating space of knowing who my siblings and my sisters are and what brings them joy and really actively moving through that. Thank you for that, Nala. I'm thinking about the question um, that was asked around find, um, personal financial advancement. I, that was the question that I was asked similar to um, my position on anti-capitalism. And as a Black trans fam who's also formerly incarcerated, I am not in a position to have access to capitalism in the way that those who have had historical positions within that power structure that exists within our society. So what I do in terms of not being able to have access, I do have access in ways of how I can bring those who do have access to that personal financial wealth to bring us resources within the communities that need it the most. I am not one who have access to it personally. So I do the best that I can with with those who do have access to that privilege. Yeah, there, there's a way of making connections that we could figure out. And I love that you pointed out access. I mean, there are people who have, who have coins that can be redistributed into these spaces, but the connection is not there. Uh, and for people that do have those privileged roles, such as being a physician or some other kind of professional who's in these networks around people who have those resources. Something I think about a lot is like, how do we make those connections to get people in the same room so they can redistribute what sometimes was earned and sometimes was not earned. Um, so I'm trying to figure that out for um, my career actively, like how do I make those connections to organizations like you two um, have here? Um, because that is one way of there being some kind of justice. Um, someone else asked in the chat too, uh, some positions of people in positions of power do not care about our lived experiences. Is it possible to get people to care about the marginalized people in this country? And my answer is that they just need to be replaced. That's kind of like my 2020 answer. Um, they need to be deleted. Um, if you can't develop an empathic connection with people who are suffering, then there's something pathological about you. So that's my answer to that. I don't know if others have answers. I, I agree. I, I think, you know, some people can be reformed. Some people can learn, others can't. And at some point you, you reach a point where you realize that this person won't change and they're doing more harm than good. And I, I think about that a lot in schools. There are certain teachers who just do not have an interest in educating black and brown children. If you look at the rates of discipline in their classrooms, they tend to be the people that have the highest rates of expelling black and brown kids. And we know that you know one suspension or one expulsion decreases the, the rates of graduation or funnels our kids into the school to prison pipeline. And some of those teachers just, they can't be reformed. And it's better and it's safer for all students to just to send those teachers out and replace them with teachers of color, um, preferably, or replace them with teachers who are willing to learn and, and recognize their own limitations and um, humility. But, but, but I agree, you know, and or if possible, if you have that flexibility, then you leave and find a better opportunity and a, a place where you feel appreciated and respected. Because again, working in a toxic environment is literally bad for your health. And I think often, um, as Black women, and, and people tell me all, I've heard so many times, you're a doctor, you don't experience racism. And it's, you know, money does not protect us. If, it, if anything, there's been studies showing Black women have, who have more money have higher rates of suicide than low to moderate income women. And it's because of the, the increased exposure to microaggressions and the increased exposure to toxic work environments and the, the constant battles that we have to fight just to establish ourselves. And, and, and so, and sometimes, you just, you can't do it. The working in this environment is doing more harm than good. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're gonna go for another hour, right? <laughs> okay. Because we have not really gotten to where we need to get to, but we are at time here. 
um, and we barely scratched the surface, but what a conversation. Oh my goodness. I, it, it, it has been an honor to be here. I knew it would be. I was so ex I was I was excited all week. I was excited all year. And here we are and we're not finished. And so perhaps we can we can stay connected. You have many hashtags that have been put into the Q&A and, and into the chat. The Hoover app the Hoover app is here for us to to communicate. Every panelist who is at this meeting is on Hoover and their profiles are there. Stay in touch with us, ask your questions. Hopefully we'll get to the questions that we didn't get to um, via, via communication outside of this space. But thank you everyone for being here. Thank you panelists. Yeah, thank you everyone. And also just wanted to say that the um, each, uh, each panel is supported by um, a digital wellness like um, app um, and for our, this in-kind supporter gift, um, Breathwork, which is an app that provides um, uh, guided breathing exercises is going to offer everyone who has come a free three months subscription. So if you want it, you just email us with the title Breathwork and we will get you uh, those apps. Thank you. This was great. This was wonderful. This was this was life giving. Thank you for this.